let's move on because we've got as always a lot to do today um, so PowerPoints everybody open up the PowerPoint let's start at the beginning as always and you might notice that we've actually got 47 slides uh, to get through in 55 minutes so apologies if I speak quickly and apologies if I skip over stuff but if I do skip over stuff that generally means that it's it's kind of background information it's not desperately important um, but I do need to go through quite a lot today so let's move on to um, straight away to um, slide number two okay so we're making progress folks um, it seems like only yesterday that uh, we all met each other albeit uh, virtually through the uh, uh, the wonders of uh, zoom and moodle and internet and all that other technology that we take for granted it's not quite the same as teaching in real life but but like i said we did do something similar for the uh, spring semester last year because covid kind of came to our shores around about uh, 12 months ago wasn't it 11 months ago so we, we, we this does work so don't don't worry too much if it's not uh, as we would like um, so slide two we're making progress so you with Adam last last week he was talking about ownership um, can I just say I've noticed I, I had a quick look at what Adam covered last week um, so some of the stuff he spoke about um, I'll, I'll be talking about today um, to, to an extent but which is no bad thing because it ties it all together so I will be talking about the uh, the, the phone hacking scandal uh, in brief because it is related to media ethics regulation and law as you might expect um, Adam discussed it more in terms of ownership um, so, but you know don't worry if there's a slight duplication so on the left uh, there we are the um, light blue circle that's where we are week five I've also included a dark blue circle and that is uh, I mentioned this in week one our esteemed visiting speaker Professor Duncan Bloy of um, Cardiff University he's a very very um, uh, very very well respected specialist in media law and social media so so today I'm not able because I tried to cover three things when I designed this presentation I wanted to cover media ethics regulation and law but there simply isn't time to do the law so between now and Duncan's session on uh, Tuesday March the 16th we will do law so don't worry about that I'm not sure when yet but we will do it um, the other thing to remember <clears throat> and I mentioned this I gave you prior warning for this is that we have a visiting speaker in the uh, workshop on Friday so at one o'clock on Friday the 19th this week uh, you will have an hour with a young woman called Charla Bullet, and Charla is a graduate of Roehampton she's an MA graduate and for the last two years since she graduated she has been building her career so I spoke in um, week three about different types of business organizations so Charla is freelance she's self-employed she's a sole trader she is doing essentially what I did for 14 years but she's doing it obviously in in a modern context so she's doing a lot of stuff online she's finding work online she's using digital media to their fullest extent so that's going to be really useful stuff for you folks because it's somebody of your generation slightly older but essentially your generation she's about 24 25 I think um, who can give you first-hand um, um, guidance and first-hand knowledge of what it's like to set up um, as a freelance and be your own boss and I've seen her presentation and she's got some good stuff in there um, Charla is to be congratulated on uh, the energy and the confidence and the creativity that she's injected into her career so far so make sure you come to the workshop on uh, on Friday um, and the other thing that we'll be doing in the workshop as well I'll be talking about assessment uh, well both assessments actually and giving you some guidance on uh, structure content and research and if you remember those are three of the five criteria that you will be assessed upon so make sure that you come to the workshop I'm sure you you will I, I must say actually attendance in this group is pretty good uh, in some groups it's not so good uh, but for some reason um, your group is pretty well engaged so well done for that it always helps to show up doesn't it folks it always makes life so, so much easier I always think about it as if you're a footballer and you don't show up for the game you ain't gonna score a goal 
you know and it's kind of like that with education as well and i know that some of you have connectivity issues and don't have broadband uh, but thank goodness for technology so everything's recorded and the powerpoints are online right let's move on um, so slide three just to tell you just to emphasize why we're talking today about ethics regulation and to a lesser extent law the module outline as you know this is a brand new module um, so me and Adam have designed it um, in a way we've kind of interpreted the brief as it were and we've we've been a little bit creative ourselves as well in how we've done it now what the module outline says the two key words three key words highlighted in red uh, it says this module will lay the groundwork for the more detailed exploration of dis different aspects of the media environment, which is one of those awful academic phrases that can mean nothing and everything. Um, so what I mean here, what, the way we've interpreted it, me and Adam, is that the UK media environment is subject to regulation and law. Um, so as you will see, we all like to think that we've got freedom of speech, but actually when you scratch the surface... Uh, we those that uh, privilege and it is a privilege compared to some countries is actually restricted um, so what we're going to talk about today is the regulation is the ethics ethical framework if you like and the regulatory f framework in the UK for the media so that's how it ties into the grand scale of things slide number four slide number four so the first thing I want to point out here is that ethics regulation and law at a previous university i had a module that was called media ethics regulation and law and it was three hours a week for 12 weeks that's 36 hours so at this other university your equivalents your counterparts had 36 hours of teaching uh, for these three subjects and even that wasn't enough I could have easily done another 36 hours. In fact, you can do whole master's degree qualifications. The whole program, the whole course is can be devoted to these subjects. So it's an enormous subject, three enormous subjects. And I'm going to have to try and cram it all into one hour <laughs> or rather two hours, my hour and Duncan's hour. So just be aware that there is much more to this than meets the eye. And my job today is introduce you to some of the basic principles and uh, restrictions on this thing called freedom of speech. Now, freedom of speech is something which hopefully you've all heard of and it all kind of makes sense to you. Uh, so freedom of speech literally means the, 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 the freedom to say what you think and to say what you believe and, and to uh, have the liberty, have the, the freedom to express yourself in a way that you think appropriate. Um, and it's one of those things that we kind of take for granted in the UK and other Western democracies as well, because in some parts of the world, freedom of speech is extremely limited, extremely limited. And I'll talk about some examples of where it is limited in a few moments. Um, but freedom of speech essentially is, is the foundation of today's class. And it's the foundation in many ways of media in general. So whether it's documentaries or news on television or YouTube, people doing stuff on YouTube or Instagram for that matter, or books or film or podcasts, there is a sort of implicit understanding that the, the, the creator of that media can say uh, basically what they like. So it's not just the words, it's the images it's the concepts and it's everything else that goes with it. So traditionally it's called freedom of speech, but I would like everybody to think of it in a broader sense, freedom of expression, how you express yourself. And like I said, we like to believe in this country that we have freedom of speech. Slide five. Um, in some countries, um, they have what's called a constitution. You might want to write that down. I'm sure you know about this because it's been in the news a lot recently. So in the United States, they have a constitution, which is basically a document that explains the relationship between government, the state, and the people. Now, we don't have one in the UK for lots of historic reasons, and it frustrates me personally that we don't have a constitution. Most countries that have been through a revolution or a very traumatic period where the country was basically reinvented 
uh, they do have a constitution. And America is the classic example, because as you probably know, America many years ago was part of the British Empire 250 years ago. And then there was a revolutionary war and the Americans kicked the British out and they set up their own country with their own parliament. And the American system of government, even though it's gone through a traumatic period recently, it is actually very robust because the founding fathers of America, they laid down in written format exactly what the rules are. So they have a constitution and they have, Americans have what's called constitutional rights. In other words, they have a right to do something and the government can't stop them from doing it. And the first amendment, in other words, the first change, if you like, or the first clause of the American Constitution in slide five, the first amendment says that Congress, that's Parliament basically, makes no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting its free exercise. So that means if you want to set up your own religion in America, you can. It doesn't matter how crazy, how far out, how way out, how unbelievable your religious point of view is um, you can set it up okay and government isn't going to stop you from doing that you can believe whatever you want essentially in America and you can preach and you can try and convert people to your way of thinking now part of that as you can imagine is freedom of speech by extension that means if, if, if individuals have freedom of speech then by extension the press in other words printed newspapers which is all they had in 1780 when this was written the press should have freedom of speech too you also have freedom of assembly so if you want to get together as a group and protest like for example on January the 6th those people that protested and then stormed the White House, uh, the Capitol building, they were exercising their freedom of expression, even though it turned out very ugly and, uh, and tragic as well. So freedom of assembly is, is a constitutional right and also the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So this is in black and white on a piece of paper in America. Every American kid, every American citizen knows about the Constitution and freedom of speech, which is the First Amendment. Right now, here is a great idea for assessment number one. Okay, hopefully you're all making notes here, folks, because there's loads of ideas in this in this show today that will help you with assessment one. So you need an assessment one to come up with an idea, something which was discussed in class that you then through a PowerPoint, five slides. I went through it in detail in a previous week. It's in the PowerPoint. So you use five slides to, to pick up on a, on a particular subject that you learned about in the teaching and you take it further, you research it and present new information. So you could, for example, look at freedom of speech. That could be your idea. Don't repeat what I've told you, what I'm going to tell you in this class, but you could take it and look at it in the context of something else. So, for example, President, ex-President Trump, as you know, shortly after January the 6th, he was banned from Twitter. And most people said, wonderful, because he's, he's been inciting violence. He's quite a repugnant character in some of the things that he says. It's great that he's been canceled by Twitter. However, however, other people said, hang on a second, we might find him repugnant. We might find his views um, unpalatable, but he is exercising his freedom of speech and that's a constitutional right. So this is a really contentious issue in America. Freedom of speech, P even if it's people are inciting hatred. Um, the American Constitution, it can be argued that those people are exercising their freedom of speech and that is more important than saying hateful things. It's a really big, big, big subject. But this could be an idea for assessment one. Does everybody I, if we were in class, you'd all be nodding your heads now, hopefully. But don't just follow my, my, my example. So don't do Twitter, Trump's Twitter ban. Look at freedom of speech maybe in a different context. So that's the United States, freedom of expression, slide six. So we've got United States Constitution, First Amendment. If you look at the United, the United Nations, next point, if you, you know what the United Nations is, it's basically, you know, it's a... a countries of the world, 196 countries or whatever, getting together in a building in New York and they discuss stuff. They discuss, discuss things like poverty. They discuss things like climate change. And they also discuss, when they, as soon as they, it was established in 1945-46, they discussed human rights. 
So human rights, it's a very abstract subject, but it's in desperately important and it affects all of us on a daily basis. So Article 19 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights says, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference from the state, typically, and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So it's there. So the world, the governments of the world have signed up for that. OK, so not only has America got the Constitution, the First Amendment, it's also got the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Also in Europe, there's the European Convention on Human Rights, the ECHR. Now, crucial point, even though the, the UK is no longer in the European Union, it is still a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, the ECHR. So that still applies, even though we're no longer in the EU. So in 1998, in terms of in terms of the UK in 1998 one of the best things that Tony Blair ever did he did lots of bad things when he was prime minister but he was very keen on the human on human rights he actually used to work as a human rights lawyer his his wife still does Cherie Blair so in 1998 the UK incorporated the European Convention on Human Rights into British law in 1998. So if you look all the way through the list there, we've got the United States, the European countries, the UK, United Nations. Freedom of expression is a fundamental human right in a liberal democracy, not in all countries, as we will see in China, in Russia, in some parts of the Middle East. It's not considered a human right, even though these countries have signed up to the UN Declaration. But in a liberal democracy, freedom of expression is desperately important. Slide seven. So if you go online and uh, check out, uh, I think it's called the um, um, Equalities Commission, there's a great website um, that, that describes in detail, slide seven, what the Human Rights Act actually is. So Human Rights Act 1998, so it sets out the fundamental rights and freedoms that everybody in the UK is entitled to. Everybody, folks, doesn't matter your age, your how wealthy you are, your ethnicity, your gender, your sexual orientation, doesn't matter. Human rights means everybody, everybody. So everybody has the, 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 the human rights that are listed there. So Article 2, article, all the way through to Article 14. And you'll notice that some of them, uh, the right to a fair trial, Article 6. No punishment without law, Article 7. So it's about crime and punishment, you know. Uh, and you'll notice Article 10 says, Article 10, protect, and I've highlighted it in the bottom right, protects your right to hold your own opinions and to express them freely without government interference. This includes the right to express your views aloud, for example, through public protest and demonstrations or through published articles, books, leaflets, television, radio, works of art, the internet and social media. So it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? So it's all enshrined in law that the state cannot stop you from saying what you think. It sounds wonderful. However, however, slide eight, there are restrictions to the human, in the Human Rights Act about how freely you can express yourself. And it says on the top, in the top left, it says public authorities may restrict this right if they can show, so they have to prove, they have to prove it in court, a court of law, that their action is lawful, necessary and proportionate. Lawful, necessary and proportionate. So number one, protecting national security. So you can't say things online that may be a threat to national security. Don't forget, the authorities have to prove that it's a threat to national security. Prevent disorder or crime. Protect health or morals. That's a, a very, very um, important one at the moment. So that, as you know, there's lots of seriously irresponsible stuff on social media and elsewhere about COVID. You know, some of these crazy remedies which don't work. You know, some of the stuff about uh, how dangerous vaccines are. And one of my mates told me that Bill Gates is involved in all this and he, he wants to inject microchips uh, through the vaccine so that he can keep tabs on us. And Bill Gates is actually a really evil person. You know, I mean, I just look at that sort of stuff and I think, that, oh, you know, don't be ridiculous. But some people believe it. Some people believe it, you know. And... Um, so, so you can freely express that online, but those those people that come out with stuff like that, they could be in danger of, of, of being taken to court and being prosecuted because it's not protecting health, you know? 
and um, and there's various other restrictions as well so the key I won't go through this in, in, in detail but if you're interested and I hope you are interested because it is very important but check out the, the Human Rights Act 1998 online uh, and have a look at the restrictions because we don't have total and universal freedom of expression and that might surprise you it might horrify you um, but there are you know good reasons why why we don't for example inciting racial hatred so if we had freedom of, complete freedom of expression that means that anybody can go online and make as as many horrible uh, racist comments as they like with 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 no, with with no restrictions on that but thankfully there are laws in place that stop that from happening you know and if people do contravene that then it's quite big news isn't it um, there was something the other week about Marcus Rashford, you know, the Man United footballer, and um, he, he's been fantastic. He's been campaigning for, uh, for you know, for free free school meals for for kids and so on. And he said the other week that he's he's been bombarded with stuff online, racist abuse online, which is despicable, you know. But if Marcus had the energy and the inclination, he he could um, prosecute those people, or certainly get the ball moving in terms of prosecuting the people who say it. So there are restrictions. On, on freedom of expression. Slide number nine. So slide number nine, I've called it free media and I put it in speech marks because our media is free to a point, to a point. And the reason we have free media, like any other democracy, is, is that in a democracy, what it means, again, it's an abstract word and we take it for granted and some people say, I'm not interested in politics. But you are, whether you know it or not, you are actually interested in politics because you want, I, I hope, that you want to know what those people in the House of Commons are doing and discussing and the decisions they're making because they're doing it on your behalf and my behalf and your parents behalf <clears throat> and not only that they are spending our money our tax money in the process so we have a right to know what they're doing right and that's what that's why I say it's a free media so the media reports on what's happening in Parliament and, and we have a, a right to, to, to know what they're doing. Two other words I've used there, accountability and transparency. Again, they're two quite pompous words, and you might kind of switch off when you hear them. Accountability means that they're doing it on our behalf. So if they do a bad job, in four years' time, we can get rid of them and vote somebody else in to do a bad job. No, to do a better job. You know, that's how democracy works. Some countries don't have that at all. Transparency, think about it as a window. So we should be able to see what they're doing. So if you've got the time and inclination, you can watch parliamentary proceedings on TV. Um, that you can go on the website, the Parliament website, and you can watch debates. And you can look at committee meetings and you can read all the documents. Not all of them, but you can read most of them. So we have that transparency. And also the media, bottom line, and us as citizens, we should have, and we do have, freedom of expression to comment on people on the MPs, on Boris Johnson, on Keir Starmer, we can make comments online about them. Um, we can criticise them. We can say they're doing a good job. You know, the media can do that. The Daily Mail, as it always does, praises the Conservatives and slags off Labour. You know, so it has freedom to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. So coming back to a point I mentioned <coughs> a few weeks ago, bias. People, talk, Students talk about bias. The Daily Mail is biased. It's in favour of the Conservative Party. The Guardian is biased in terms of it generally supports the Labour Party. Nothing wrong with that, folks. Nothing wrong with that. It's expected that, that we have a vibrant and diverse media. So it's not really bias. It's just taking a position. But thank goodness we do. So we have a choice. We have a choice of perspectives in the UK and uh, in other democracies as well. In comparison to slide number 10, the photograph here shows um, a load of Chinese politicians. So this is the People's Republic of China, capital city Beijing. And uh, in China, they, have, they don't have democracy. The, the, the academic word we use to describe regimes like that is totalitarianism. And uh, Chinese, I used to teach a lot of Chinese students and they got very upset when I used this slide. Uh, because they personally don't believe that it is a totalitarian society. They believe they have a democracy. But when I explain to them what our democracy looks like compared to their democracy, they're quite shocked by how much of a difference there is. So in totalitarianism, basically, there is one political party. There is only one choice. In fact, you've only got one choice, so it's not a choice. So if the Chinese Communist Party has been in power for the last, what, 70 years, longer, 72 years. There has been no, there have been elections, but there's never a choice on the ballot paper. So you either have one, you either get the Communist Party or the Communist Party. 
and within that there is no right to know so that the Chinese people have no um, uh, no uh, no right to know what the government are doing behind the scenes there is little accountability and transparency so decisions are made behind closed doors and restrict and freedom of, of expression is restricted you've seen that with the clampdown on Hong Kong recently uh, you know it's quite a complex story but basically that all of those protesters in Hong Kong they were campaigning for democracy until recently and basically the Chinese government ended up and said right that's it enough of that discussion and debate and protest and they basically got involved in mass arrests and these poor people they're locked up in jails in uh, China and they have no very very few rights they don't have a right to a fair trial they don't have a right to a lawyer all the things that we take for granted and that's what a totalitarian regime is another example to a slightly lesser extent is Russia and some of the regimes in, in the Middle East are, are like this as well. I think Iran is pretty much a totalitarian regime. Saudi Arabia, um, they have elections, but it's essentially the same family that's been in charge of Saudi Arabia for the last 70 or 80 years. So, so there are plenty of examples around the world. So, you know, we should count our blessings. But don't forget, you know, these freedoms have been fought for over the years. You know, it's not a case of powerful people say, sure, have some freedom of expression. It doesn't work like that. If you look at history, then people have had to fight for these things. So in China, imagine this, no Facebook, no Wikipedia, no YouTube. Um, I'm not sure about Instagram. I suspect not, you know. So they have their own social networking service. And I think one's called Weibo, W-E-I-B-O. TikTok is a Chinese um, uh, um, org organization. I'm not sure how much freedom of expression you have on TikTok. If you put something on TikTok, a critical of the Chinese Communist Party, I suspect you'd have your account closed. Um, because most Chinese companies, they are linked to the Chinese Communist Party. Can you imagine that in this country, um, where companies are, are directly linked and controlled by, uh, con uh, by uh, politicians? So that's China. That's the contrast. Contrast. And slide 11. Um, and believe it or not, in the West, in democracies, we do have considerable limits of on our freedom of expression and I've used some examples there um, of uh, historically of 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 media uh, in the broader sense of the term uh, that has been either banned or criticized or cancelled whatever word you, you want to use now I'll just go through through a couple of them very quickly because we're running out of time as always has anybody heard of William Tyndale bottom left he was born in 1494 died in 1536 I'll have a sip of tea. Has anybody heard of him? Don't Google him. No? Well, if anybody in the class is a Christian, then you have a lot to thank William Tyndale for. And that guy suffered in the most extreme form. So William Tyndale was the first person to publish the Bible in English, believe it or not. I think it was about um, in early... 16th century about 1530 he was the first person to publish an English version of the Bible prior to that every Bible that was ever printed was print in the UK it was printed in either Greek or Latin and the problem with that Tyndale said that's a real problem because that means that normal people cannot read the Bible of their own accord they would need a priest who speaks Latin to explain it to them and hence the priest can change the message depending on his and it always is or was a his a he uh, preferences so Tyndale was a complete revolutionary and against all the rules he printed that he translated the Bible into English and published it it was the first time the Bible was published in English and he was accused and convicted believe it or not of heresy and the picture there shows his sad demise he was strangled and then burnt at the stake and the reason is, is because the, the powers that be, the authorities, the Church of England um, and uh, the, uh, the, ro the, the royal, uh, the monarch at the time, uh, decided that that was too revolutionary. It was too dangerous to give normal people the Bible in a format that they could read and understand. Because most of the UK didn't speak it, didn't read Latin, of course. And not many people read English, actually, for that matter. So that is good. And I don't know whether you Christians in the audience, whether you knew that. But, but if you look back in the history um, of Christianity and the Bible, there, there, there's a hell of a story there. And it's quite tragic in many cases. And we take that for granted, of course, that we can read the Bible in English these days or, 
or uh, in any other um, language as well. Um, fast forward, Nazi Germany, of course, it was a democracy, believe it or not, in, early, in the early 1930s. And uh, Nazi Germany went through this incredibly painful and tragic period of burning books. So books by Jewish authors were burned. There's something in horribly symbolic about burning a book. And somebody once said, once a, once a society starts burning books, the next thing it does is burns people. So whenever people start doing that, we should be extremely worried. Um, in the late 1960s, uh, the Beatles, my favourite band, um, they got into trouble. They had several of their songs banned by the BBC. In the United States, the, uh, um, a big bunch of people in the States decided to burn their albums uh, because John Lennon made a comment about the Beatles being... Um, in some people's opinion, he was quoting, he said, in some people's opinion, the Beatles are more important than Jesus. He wasn't saying that he thought the Beatles are more important than Jesus. He was mer merely reflecting on the fact that some people spend more time listening to his music than they do reading the Bible. And, um, and as a result, Middle America, the Bible Belt so-called, they uh, threw away all the Beatles records and didn't play them on the radio anymore and they burned them. Um, so that was, uh, and they also had uh, music uh, that some of their songs banned as well because the authorities decided they were making references to drugs and sex and all the other usual stuff. And in my uh, period, generation, a bit more Sex Pistols, a great band from the 1960s, uh, 70s, they uh, made a song called God Save the Queen and that was banned. And also you might know the name Salman Rushdie. Um, he published a book called The Satanic Verses in 1988. Uh, which was, um, and uh, the uh, Ayatollah, the, the religious leader in Iran, uh, banned it. And uh, not only that, he pronounced what's called a fatwa, which means because Salman Rushdie made such uh, sacrilegious comments in this book, he was critical, I think, of Islam in the book. Um, then the, the Ayatollah said that it's okay to kill Salman Rushdie. And until very recently, that's what, 32 years ago, until recently, Salman Rushdie had permanent police protection. So even in the, in the UK, even in a mature democracy with freedom of expression as a law of the land, there are still limits uh, on, uh, on what you can say. Um, so slide 12, I think I'm going to run out of time here. So don't worry, we'll catch up at some point. <clears throat> so within the UK... Believe it or not, the media is controlled in a number of ways. And I put control in speech marks because it's not what you call direct control. It's not direct control. It's kind of indirect control. China has direct control. The government says you can't do this, you can't do that. But in the UK, it's done in a more subtle way. Um, and essentially, there are three ways in which the media is control. control. Let's start at the bottom with ethics. And you'll notice it's in smaller letters and a different colour. So ethics, and I'll describe them in a minute. They're not as powerful a control mechanism as the next one up, regulation, which is in a larger font. So regulation is more powerful than ethics. And the most powerful one is the law, the law of the land. So the higher up that, the hierarchy you go, there's more control and the penalties are greater. More control and the penalties are greater. So if you break the law, as you know, you can be fined or you can in some cases go to jail. So that is the most punitive uh, penalties. Uh, regulation. Uh, if you break regulation, you, you can't go to jail, but you might be fined. Ethics, you don't get fined, you don't go to jail, um, but, but you know, you can still lose a reputation. So, so think about it in those terms. The higher up that stack you go, the more control and the greater the penalties. Let's talk slide 13 about ethics. If anybody's got any questions, points, whatever, dive in. So ethics, what this means, you've probably come across this at, at school or maybe in in a previous branch of education. Um, or if you're a religious person, you, you know all about ethics, you know? Um, so ethics, what it is, it's the branch of philosophy that s seeks to address questions about morality. So morality, moral issues, ethical issues, what's right and what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what constitutes justice, what's virtuous, all of that sort of stuff. That's the territory we're, we're talking about here. That's what ethics means. So we have ethics within the media industry. Um, slide 14, um, as I say, if you, if you are religious, and it doesn't really matter which faith is, is, is your own, uh, you're probably used to ethics and morals, uh, because whether it's the Catholic Church, there's, uh, I think it's one of the previous uh, popes, 
though I forget which one I'm not uh, religious particularly but that obviously it's a pope uh, and on the right hand side I think that's the um, the, the religious read leader in Iran uh, I did this slide a while ago and I've reused it but anyway it doesn't really matter whether it's Christianity or Islam or Sikhism or Hinduism or any of the world's great religions um, generally speaking or Buddhism generally speaking each of the religions has what's called a moral framework uh, and philosophers would call it moral absolutism. So in other words, according to, to, to Roman Catholicism, some actions are always wrong. And it's the same in Islam. I don't know a lot about Islam, but as I understand it, alcohol that is always forbidden, right? So there are various things which are always wrong. So that's kind of like the moral foundations of faith. And the thing is that they're always wrong, even if they lead to beneficial or less harmful consequences. And the Catholic Church over the years has had a lot of criticism because the Catholic Church has always said that abortion is always wrong, even in the, the, the extreme cases like, God forbid, incest, you know, or, or if, if, if it, if it, um, if it threatens the if, if a birth would threaten the life of the of the mother or whatever it might be and the church has come under a lot of criticism for that because it's it traditionally been very uh, very immovable it's always wrong abortion is always wrong although there are signs now that the church is changing its mind so that's moral absolutism and that's typically what you get with faith slide 15 in in normal in the normal course of events in normal life what you'll notice is that ethics are not universal so in religion they are universal so they apply always to everybody so different philosophies slide 15 different cultures different religions have different ethical foundations it depends on cir circumstances professions have different ethics and people depending on what's happening people are sometimes unethical even though they're very ethical at other times i'll give you a couple of examples here i say circumstances uh, i've written there george f f from ghana just as a reminder many years ago when i taught at cardiff one of my students he was a really nice guy a guy called george from ghana funnily enough and uh, he came to my office once and he was uh, for various reasons that i won't go into he was absolutely stony broke he was he was literally down to his last pound and he looked terrible he hadn't been eating and he was really really suffering and uh, he came to me and said what can we do and you know how bu universities operate like bureaucracies so i went to my boss and i said explain the situation i said can we sort him out with some money you know he's desperate and he can't go to the state because he can't claim universal credit or anything um so anyway to cut a long story short i was felt so sorry for george i actually gave him 50 quid in cash and uh, I told my boss, and guess what? I got into trouble for that. Now, I, I personally, I thought I was doing the guy a favour, and nobody else was doing him a favour, and I didn't want the money back. Um, but she said, no, you can't do that, because as a lecturer, you have a professional um, responsibility to act ethically, and you can't get involved in financial transactions, essentially, with students. I, thankfully, I didn't get into trouble for it, and I think I did the right thing. Uh, but normally I wouldn't give people 50 quid. So don't get any ideas, folks. I'm not going to start dishing out 50 quids in your direction. Um, but that was a, 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 a specific set of circumstances. Professions, codes of conduct. We'll talk about journalistic codes of conduct in a minute. And, uh, and there are also codes of conduct for doctors, medical doctors and so on. And people, you know, they change. And the, the word I've used there is revenge. Think about revenge. Um, and I, 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 I don't think revenge, personally, I don't think it's a good thing. But I've had conversations with friends over the years, particularly when they've broken up with their partner. And they say, I'm going to get my own back. I'm going to get him back for that. You know, and what happens with revenge is it tends to backfire. It tends to backfire on the person who's seeking revenge. But my point here is that people who are usually normal, you know, kind, caring people can be quite bitter and angry and really vindictive if, if they are crossed. Personally, I would recommend that you don't do revenge because I've seen some terrible examples of where it's backfired. Um, so ethics are not universal, but ethical dilemmas are. So ethical dilemmas are a problem, an ethical issue. They affect us all. And if you don't believe me, think about soap operas. You know, EastEnders, Hollyoaks, Coronation Street, whatever. They are packed full, aren't they, of ethical dilemmas. What's the right thing to do? Should I do this? Should I not do it? Should I tell her? Should I not tell him? And let me give you an example. In slide number 16, I'm going to throw this one over to you. Let me tell you a story. This is another true story, again from Cardiff. And uh, this was about, oh gosh, 10, 15 years ago. 
and I had a group of MA students and uh, one day this student called Robert and you see him there he, he kind of looked a little bit like that he didn't have his mustache but but he's, he's kind of uh, kind of you know that's not a, a bad representation of Robert so Robert came to my office and he said Gary can I have a chat with you and I said sure what is it he said well you know that David and Beth and you see them pictured there uh, they also on the same course uh, you know that they're in, you know massively in love and they're in a, in a in a committed relationship and I said yeah and he said well he said I was at a party at the weekend slide number 17 I was at a party at the weekend and for some reason David wasn't there but Beth was and uh, she was getting very close to this other guy called Carl and they were sharing a, having a drink together and dancing and etc etc and he made it quite clear that there was no doubt in his mind that they were that Beth essentially was cheating on David and Robert said to me he said I don't know what to do I really genuinely don't know what to do he says I know both of them I know Beth and David but David's a really good mate of mine so should I tell him or should I not or what should I do so over to you folks just dive in turn your microphone on if this was you if you were Robert and you had two friends Beth and David what would you do because I, I I found I found it hard to to um to to advise him here anybody want to add anything come on folks I'm sure you've experienced this haven't you with your mates and so on tell David Diab you tell David right can anybody say what the negative of telling David is yeah it, it, it would I mean let, let me tell you because we're running out of time I've, I've grossly underestimated how long this is going to take we'll pick up with this on 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 on, on Friday yes yeah you're right yeah yeah you're right Harry but the point is the, the, the whatever you do whatever Robert did and I said this to him, I said Robert whatever you do it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna be bad isn't it so you cannot tell him don't, don't, just don't get involved you could do that and of course David will find out in the future that, that Beth has been cheating and David will say why didn't you tell me Robert I thought you were my mate or you can tell him and as um, as Harry said David might think he's lying or be upset that his heart's broken um, or I've done this exercise before in previous classes and somebody said well Robert should have a word with Beth which is not a bad idea or he should have a word with Carl possibly but this is a, a, an eternal dilemma isn't it getting involved in other people's lives this is what soap operas are based on isn't it let, let me tell you what actually happened I mean I said to Robert I, I, I went through the options with Robert and I said I, I said you're damned if you do and damned if you don't Robert that's the problem and Robert thought about it and I said I can't I can't advise you I said it's completely up to you I said I really do empathize and sympathize but it's completely up to you so in the end Robert did tell David and believe it or not David was so shocked and horrified and didn't believe him that David and Robert broke friends they they, they were no longer friends and then lo and behold a few months later David found out that Beth was uh, uh, this was her personality basically they, they, she wasn't really what you call um, a one-man woman I think that's probably the way to describe it um, and they separated so but it's a terrible it's a terrible ethical dilemma and uh, I hope you folks don't have to be faced by that I've been in that situation before in the past and it's a horrible thing to deal with um, so let me give you another one but that's an ethical dilemma so j j the point here is that ethics it sometimes it's a question of opinion it's a matter of opinion whether something is ethical or not let me give you another example slide 18 slide 18 ethical people right so imagine that your ex-partner your ex-partner folks called Nick so Nick is one of the, the reason I've cho chosen this name it can be male or female so wh whatever well it doesn't matter whether you have male p partners or female partners imagine that Nick has won the X factor and has become famous so this is an ex of yours and the Sun the newspaper that you know likes a bit of scandal the Sun doesn't it the Sun says big front page headline if you've got any stories about Nick we want to hear from you and they're offering money and the Sun does this is exactly how it operates you think about those folks who are on Love Island in previous years you know but within a, a week or so as soon as or Big Brother when it was around as soon as those people appear on TV the Sun and the Star and the other gossip magazines they are full of stories about those people and they come from their friends so folks if it was your partner Nick your ex-partner and they were offering money so tell me what would you do w would would you offer stories would you not offer stories what would you do tell me Diab you wouldn't say anything why not why not 
Respect everyone, yeah. All right then, Adam, have you heard the phrase, everybody's got a price? How about if the sun says, I'll give you a thousand quid? Tell us what Nick had for breakfast, Adam, and I'll tell, and I'll give you a thousand quid. What about 10,000 quid? What about if they said, we'll pay off your student loan? You know, I mean, it's, it's easy. It's, well, no, she's an ex. He or she's an ex. Don't forget. When I've done this exercise before, people have said, well, if she's an ex or if he's an ex, then it doesn't matter because they're an ex for a good reason. You know, so, so, so I usually when we do this in class, I get a whole variety of, of, of answers to this question. Some people says, they say it depends how much money. Some people say, take the point of view that Diab and Adam have taken that you definitely wouldn't say anything ever. Other people have said, um, if I really, you know, if we fell out under bad terms, I would tell them, but not if we're still friends. <laughs> Harry says you'll tell them something really boring, and they probably wouldn't pay you anything for that, Harry, because it, because it has, uh, it has, um, it's got no real news value. It needs to be something, you know. It needs to be something substantial. But the the key point here, and again, I wish we were doing it in class. If we were doing it in class, we would get a big spectrum of of, of answers, and I'd give you different scenarios, you know. Nick turned out to be a cheat. Nick cheated on you, so now you hate them. So would that alter your opinion? Or it depends how much they pay. Or it depends what sort of information. But the thing about ethics, this is the key point why I'm doing this, especially like with the Robert and David and Beth story. It all depends on circumstances, and it depends on the people involved, and it depends on, on what's actually, uh, what is required, what needs to be done. So slide 19, what about if you're working? This is where it blends into the world of work. So we've been talking so far about individual ethics, but what if you're working for a tabloid newspaper? Now I'm, I'm gonna ask that rhetorically because we're running out of time, but those tabloid newspapers, News of the World doesn't exist anymore, the Sun, the Star, the, the Mirror, etc. Basically, if you read them, they are full of gossip and scandal and people telling stories about each other, aren't they? So if you're a journalist, your job is to find those stories. And on numerous occasions, I know people that have worked for tabloids, and I've read books, biographies about people who work for tabloids, and they say that they have ethical dilemmas on a daily basis because they, for example, they, they, they go and stand outside an actress's door waiting for them to go and buy a pint of milk because they need a story and they feel guilty about it. But their boss has told them to do it. And if they don't do it, they will probably get fired. You know, so if you're working for one of these newspapers, be careful what you wish for, folks. If you work for a gossip magazine, because you will be expected to do something that you probably wouldn't do in your normal daily personal life. Um, thankfully, slide number 20, there is an organization that's been around for a long time, over 100 years, called the NUJ, the National Union of Journalists. And I'm a member of the NUJ. And the NUJ, like all unions, what it does is it campaigns for better pay and conditions for its members. So it's a very noble organisation. I recommend if you want to be a journalist, you join the NUJ. And the NUJ has a th something called the Code of Conduct. So what the Code of Conduct is, is it's something that as a journalist, you kind of agree with. You implicitly sign up to it. Now, it's not a case of like signing a contract and saying, I will do this. And if I don't do it, you can fire me. But these are basically the ethical um, the ethical dimensions, if you like, of journalism in the UK. Slide 21, you can check that this, again, this is great. This is, folks, make a note of it. This is great potential for assessment one. Great potential for assessment one. Slide 21. So what the, what the uh, code of conduct says is 12 things. You might recognize number 12 because that's important for you as students, right? You, you do not copy other people's work. It's a bad thing. Don't do it. Um, you know, so that is one of the ethical considerations of professional journalism. Point number one, at all times upholds and defends the principle of media freedom, the right of freedom of expression, the right of public to be informed. Second point, strives to ensure that information disseminated is honestly conveyed, accurate and fair. So these are the, and there are various other ones that you can read through at your, uh, at your leisure. But in each of those 12 cases, you can find examples of where a journalist has not followed the ethical code. This is, like I say, this is great potential for assessment number one. So you could choose something, for example, um, 
like number six, does nothing to intrude into anybody's private life, grief or distress, unless justified by overriding consideration of the public interest. So the public interest means that the public needs to know this. It is, it's it really important. So if a politician is, is, for example, stealing money, you know, you can, as a journalist, intrude into that politician's life. And it's justified because that politician is our servant. Politicians are our servants in a democracy, folks. Don't forget that. They're working for us. So if they're stealing money or being deceptive, then you could argue that you can intrude in their private life. For example, using long lens photography or whatever it might be. And there was a cases a few years ago of politicians who were making these, these grand statements uh, about uh, integrity and not cheating and being honest. And a whole bunch of them, they were all conservatives, by the way, they were found out by the Daily Mirror to be cheating on their wives. So on one hand, they're saying you've got to be moral and be a good person. And yet the whole, there's about six or seven of them. They were all cheating on their wives. And the, the journalists intruded into their privacy. But you can argue quite well, quite strongly, that that was justified. Because they, they say one thing and they're doing another. They're hypocrites, basically. So this is really good potential for, um, for um, uh, uh, assessment number one. Um, so slide number 22. Slide number 22. As I said at the beginning, think of this as a hierarchy. So at the bottom, you've got professional codes. So the NUJ code is a professional code. Okay, and if you contravene it, if you break the code, the worst thing that can probably happen to you is that you lose respect from your colleagues and your boss, maybe, and the, the people that read your work. The next one up is company codes. So the Guardian and the BBC and various other publications, they have their own ethical guidelines which people who work for those organisations are expected to follow. And if you don't follow them, and it's the same at the university, if I don't follow the ethical code at the university, then in theory I can be fired for breach of contract. Okay, so, that, that, so that's quite that. So that obviously the penalty is much higher if you breach a, a company code. And then above that you've got what's called self-regulation, which is for printed media, which, and then above that, you've got a statutory body, and that's for broadcast media, media. And the one that is above everything is the law. So think about these restrictions, these control mechanisms in terms of a hierarchy. Let's talk uh, 2023 20, about media regulation. So the key point on um, slide number 23, when you think about it, all industries are regulated in some way. So think about the food industry. When you buy a takeaway, you know, fried chicken and chips, whatever, from from Lucky Chicken Shop or whatever. Believe it or not, that industry is regulated. You know they've got food hygiene certificates, right? You see a sticker in the window that says food hygiene. So even the fast food industry is regulated. When you buy an electrical product, it has to be tested, it has to be safe. So cars have to be, have to be safe, so that all industries are regulated. Don't forget, freedom of media in a democracy is fundamental. So, so that this freedom and regulation, they are kind of antagonistic forces. So government control is resisted fiercely by newspaper publishers, by TV stations. They don't like being controlled, but there is a sort of implicit understanding that, that the media does need to be regulated in some way. So next point, the media is generally regulated through constraint. Constraint. And there's a difference between constraint and the word in the next sentence, which is restraint. So in the UK and America, it's constraint. It tends to be internal, so organisations regulate themselves. Somebody once said it's a bit like students marking their own homework, which maybe you can associate with. You know, so students decide their own rules. Students decide, you know, what constitutes a good piece of work or not. And that's one of the criticisms of self-regulation. But it is certainly a lot better than media restraint, as in uh, China and other places. So slide number 24. I'm going to skip through these, but basically in the printed media, so we're talking newspapers, magazines, ethics has always been an issue. It's not a recent thing. It's been happening ever since newspapers were invented 300 years ago. And over the years, um, there have been various royal commission. A royal commission is like a political investigation where experts, people like myself, might get involved in it. Media academics, and you would analyse over a long period of time. Um, how the, the printed media performs. And this happened, first of all, in the late 40s, and it ended up with something called the General Council of the Press, um, which, which was basically a regulatory body uh, for the printed media. And as it says at the bottom, the spectre of statutory controls, power of the law was present. So that kind of, the, the GCP existed, next slide, 
um, for about, what, 20 years, 15, 20 years, and it was replaced, because it was seen as not being very uh, effective, it was replaced in 1963 by something called the Press Council. Uh, which included, it says some lay members. What lay members means is members of the public. So if ever a case came up in front of the press council about, you know, journalists intruding privacy or harassing people, for example, the, 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 jour the journalist in the publication would, would be judged by members of the public and um, other professionals as well. So there was another Royal Commission 61. There was another Royal Commission in 1974. Then there was something called the Calcutt Committee, another political investigation in 1989. And then finally, uh, the, the GCP was, re uh, the Press Council, sorry, was replaced by the Press Complaints Commission. So we've had three statutory bodies. It's all self-regulation. It's the media regulating itself. So it's a bit like them saying they get found out and then they say, OK, we'll be, we'll be good now. You know, it's a bit like your little brother, little sister. OK, Mum, I won't do it again. Um, you know, will be good now. But they, the, the press have always wanted to regulate themselves. Always regulate themselves. Slide number 26. That all changed about 10 years ago. You've probably heard of this. The phone hacking scandal. I think Adam possibly spoke about this. Um, I'm not going to go into great lengthy vivid detail, but it was a horrendous episode. And basically the news, internationals, newspapers, so The Sun, The News of the World, and a couple of others, and the Daily Mirror was also involved as well. Um, they got found out hacking people's phones, and there were literally hundreds of people who had their phones hacked. In other words, their phones broken into so that the journalists can listen to voicemail messages. You know, can you imagine that? If a journalist can hack your phone and listen to your voicemail messages and maybe read your texts as well. Uh, Sienna Miller is, is featured there. And I've got a YouTube link at the bottom. Just have a click on that when you get some time and listen to Sienna Miller talking about how the, pre how the press uh, uh, harassed her. It's, it's quite frightening. And it's celebrities, sports people, politicians. And, and the, 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 the journalists from that organisation, the News of the World and The Sun, were absolutely despicable. And it all came from the top, of course. It all came from the editors. The editors, um, you know, told journalists to get out there, find a story, I don't care how you do it. And journalists, because they were under such pressure, they bent and broke the rules. Slide 27, the most graphic and sickening examples, you probably know about these, Madeleine McCann, this little girl who tragically disappeared um, from a holiday home in Portugal many years ago. She's never been discovered. And the, da the Daily Express in particular absolutely hounded the parents of, of this poor little girl and they har harassed them and, uh, and, and, uh, and were very, very threatening and never let them alone when they were trying to grieve and come to terms with the loss of their child. And, and the other classic and terrible example was Millie Dowler. Uh, a young um, girl, who, a young woman who disappeared March 2002. Her body was discovered in September of the same year. But over those six month periods, um, the journalists were basically hacking her phone, you know, and they were deleting voicemail messages, which made Millie's parents think that maybe Millie was still alive because the, the number of voicemail messages was going down. You know, it was a terrible, terrible episode. And I've got loads of links here. Um, if you look through these slides and you can follow this through, uh, and hopefully you knew something about this already, and I think Adam spoke about it. So anyway, slide 28, what happened as a result of the phone hacking scandal? And it really was a scandal. It dragged on for years and years and years. The government announced this thing called the Leveson Inquiry, Brian Leveson, a senior judge. And he conducted, over the period of about, of about a year, from July, September onwards, an inquiry into the culture practices and ethics of the press. And it, as I said, it lasted for about a year. Slide number 29. You can click on the link uh, at the bottom and you can read all about it. His final report uh, was very damning about the way that these journalists conduct themselves. Very damning about News Corp and Rupert Murdoch and the news. The news of the world, of course, was closed. That was Murdoch's response. It was a bit of an empty response because he closed it and simply reopened it as the sun on Sunday. And I personally haven't noticed any difference in the way that journalists do their job. Um, so I think this is an ongoing problem. And one of the things that Leveson said on slide 29, and this is what Professor Bloy will be talking about, and he said, let's not forget online. Online is not regulated. Online is not regulated like broadcast or like print. And Leveson described it as an ethical vacuum. And you know that, folks, right, from your own personal experiences. People don't follow any particular rules online. There's some pretty despicable, disgusting stuff. 
online, you know, trolling and all that sort of stuff. So Leveson did open the door there for maybe regulation. And it's something which government are discussing as we speak. So let me just finish off. I've gone over time and I apologise. Um, so what happened as a result of Leveson, slide number 30, uh, was that the printed media, the newspapers and magazines got together again and they reinvented the PCC, the Press Complaints Commission, and they call it now the Independent Press Standards Organisation, IPSO. So this happened in 2014. And you'll notice, if you go to the website and have a little bit of a click around, you'll notice there's something called the Editor's Code of Practice. And you'll also notice it's divided into certain sections, accuracy, privacy, harassment, intrusion into grief or shock, etc. Very similar to what used to be on the PCC website. And also very similar, as you will find out next time, to what the broadcasters have to do. But when you get some time, folks, click through those links on this slide, slide number 30, and get an understanding of what these things actually are. And you will notice, really important, that it will say that there are exceptions. So it will say something like, journalists should ref respect people's privacy unless there is a good reason not to respect privacy. So it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, we're not going to do it, but if we do do it, it's for good reason. You know, so, so that it's, not really, it's not really any different to what we had 10 years ago or what we had 50 years ago for that matter. But just be aware, the press, the, 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 the printed media, magazines, self-regulation, um, other media, as you will find out next time, um, have stricter regulation. Uh, I'll finish off with slide number 31. Further reading. I, if anybody likes reading books, and I hope you all do, and I hope you're interested in such things, um, I really recommend Hack Attack by Nick Davis. Nick Davis was a Guardian journalist. I think he's retired now. Uh, but he was behind the investigation into what, what was happening with Rupert Murdoch's uh, newspapers. And it's a fantastic book. It's depressing, but fantastic, if that makes sense. And also read up on, on some, of the, uh, some of the fallout from the hacking scandal. Andy Coulson, who used to be the editor of the News of the World, he went to jail. His, his crimes were so horrendous that he actually got convicted. His uh, colleague and also former lover, Rebecca Brooks, you might have heard of her as well, uh, she got off with it. And, and everybody thought she'd get convicted as well, but somehow she didn't. But just have a read around that, that episode because it is pretty horrific. Um, but, it, you know, it's a good story, but it's terrible for the victims. But there were literally hundreds of people who were affected and it cost Rupert Murdoch and his organisation hundreds of millions of pounds. OK, so we'll stop there at slide 31. We'll do the remainder on, uh, on Friday. Uh, so don't forget, we're going to have a busy day Friday. I'll give you guidance on structure, content and research. Uh, you'll hear all about uh, Charles, our visiting speaker's story so far and I'll finish off these final slides. I'm sorry to race through it so quickly folks, it has been recorded, there's loads of hyperlinks to follow, think about assessment one, there's loads of good material here. Has anybody got any questions, comments, points, discussion, etc? I presume not because nobody said, I've either sent you to sleep or I've enthralled you, one of the two and I'm never quite sure what. Hopefully it makes sense.